The, uh, our next um, session is about community partnership and engagement, uh, which is all about matter, uh, capturing what matters to Fano. And I have Sean Fitzgerald to share his wisdom on this topic. He's a skilled facilitator and done lots of community engagement. Sean, could I ask you to introduce yourself, please? Yes, uh, thank you, Amarjeet and Kanita for inviting me this morning. Kia ora, everybody. Uh, my name is Sean, and for the last 20 years or so, uh, I've been working with small groups, medium groups, and larger groups um, all around the world. I've been lucky enough to uh, be able to take deep dives into a whole bunch of different cultures, including places like um, Brazil and Argentina and Colombia, uh, Malaysia, uh, Dubai, Egypt, um, as well as in the UK and across Europe, where I was based for five years. Uh, my wife is from here uh, in the Wellington region, and we moved out to the Kapiti Coast with my son when he was about to start school. Um, so uh, I, I am very pleased to be with you because uh, you're working on something that's so fundamental. It's such a core part of all of us as humans, um, uh, our health and the health of our Fano and our loved ones. Um, so Amarjeet sort of invited me here to specifically share my thoughts on what I think uh, good engagement looks like with the community. And I know that each of you are going to have thoughts on that as well. But the first thing I would say is that um, it doesn't have to be perfect. And I think especially when you're kind of jumping into a new endeavor like this, uh, that is really important because as we just heard, uh, sometimes things can be complex and can be a little bit messy. So I'm gonna share just a few visuals with you so that we can, you don't have to look at me the entire time. Okay, so we heard about um, all of the different aspects that are gonna be working together to help make this transformation as effective as possible. And th this concept of you know, putting people together, putting organizations together, putting groups that traditionally might've been marginalized into a seat where they really have a position and a voice, um, that is gonna give us the best ideas and the best outcomes. So specifically the part that I'm here to, I suppose, share a little bit of, of my experience with is, how we can help people feel comfortable and feel empowered with that sharing and really help people to participate. Um, so I, I'm gonna start off sharing about a, a seminar that I um, led years ago in a little place called Villa Hermosa in Mexico. And it was a three day seminar where there was gonna be 125 people. Um, and now I speak some Spanish, hablo un poco español, but for a three day seminar with professionals and with Fano, um, I definitely need a translation help. And if I was in Europe, it probably would have been a professional translator who could translate everything with their hands tied behind their back. Um, but in places in developing countries, oftentimes the, the organizers of whatever we're, symposium we're working on will have somebody who speaks English quite well, who volunteers to be the translator. Um, so I'm, I'm quite familiar with that. The first morning I'm setting up the translator as we're about to dive into this workshop. We've got all these people who are anticipating and excited, um, ready to go. And as I'm talking to the translator, he's coming across as very confident. He's, he's super confident that this is gonna be no problem at all. Um, he's not that uh, interested in any input that I have to give him any tips or strategies. And he also um, isn't interested in the subject matter. And at that time in that space, I was working a lot in the disability sector. Um, and so we start the workshop, and I can see within moments that he's starting to sweat. Um, he's got all of these eyes on him, waiting for him to translate as quickly as he can. And there's actual sweat forming on the top of his lip and across his brow. Um, and so I make a note during the morning break, I've got to make sure that I'm encouraging to him and you know, give him some, some tips and let him know that it's okay to be patient. I don't get the chance because during the morning break, he just zips out through the door and he's gone, nowhere to be found. Um, so uh, got a bunch of people there ready to continue the workshop, no translator. So I talked to the organizers um, of the seminar um, and they say, well, we have someone else here who uh, he has his PhD. Uh, he's an expert in this field. 
and he, he got his PhD up in the US, so his English is very good. So he agrees to translate. Now, as we're going through the rest of the morning, people start interrupting him and arguing with him because even though his English was excellent, and obviously he was a native Spanish speaker, um, he was very opinionated. He had strong vested interests. And there was other groups who were represented there who were really not happy with how he was translating. Um, and they were pushing against his vested interest. So people were actually yelling out at him during the workshop. So he was fired. Uh, at lunchtime by the organizers. And we were on to translator number three on the very first day. Um, and the third translator was a, a doctor who was excellent. He was caring. Um, he was invested in you know, the topic that we were focused on. Um, and his English and his translation was really precise. But uh, like many doctors, he was a really busy guy. So he had to rush off later that afternoon and he could not participate in the three days. Um, so what we'd noticed throughout the day was there was a young woman who was a recent psychology student, that's Loris here in the middle, and her English wasn't great. Like it took her a while sometimes to find certain words and she kind of would stammer and get stuck sometimes, but she was really diligent. She was really sincere and really enthusiastic. She was there as a participant, not to translate, not even to support the group. But during the break times when people were coming up and they had questions in English, Loris was just of her own accord coming in and helping with the English translation because she cared and she wanted to make a difference. So we pulled Loris in and she was happy to support us uh, for the afternoon. And Loris was the one who was the translator. And there was times where she struggled to find the perfect word or where it took her some extra time. But this time, instead of the group yelling out things to her or being argumentative, the entire group was patient and encouraging uh, because they knew that Loris cared and that she was doing her very best to translate as best she could in a non-biased way. Um, and so by the end of the workshop, she really became like a, a huge part of the workshop. She was like a... Um, what do you call that when you have a, a, a mascot? She was like a mascot for the workshop. And she went on actually to continue to work with that group. And she actually came for a period of time and interned and across the world and lived with me and my wife for a few months. Um, so uh, it's a great example of leading with the heart when it comes to connecting with a community is always going to be the most powerful thing. Um, and that would be sort of, Piece number one, I suppose. The second thing that I was thinking of when I was thinking about what makes community engagement successful is um, persistence. And in the collective um, impact model, that would be called continuous communication. And so that continuous communication, let me just hide that, that continuous communication is what really makes the difference between uh, a workshop or a seminar or symposium or some type of health engagement where you get together and let's be honest, we've probably all done that, where you have a community engagement day that's decent, might even be inspiring, but if it's a one-off, it can leave you feeling unsatisfied, like was this really worth the time and will it make a real difference? So the continuous communication between all of the groups, the continuous communication with the community is what makes a difference because that really leads people to feel like they can trust what's happening here, like there will be action that's gonna take place. That grows people's motivation and their satisfaction with what they're doing. So that continuous communication takes time, um, but it's worth it because it's more likely going to lead to uh, the type of outcomes that you wanna create, those really successful outcomes. So those would be two of the big things, and I think they fit really well into the um, collective impact model. Uh, additional thoughts that I have on what makes good engagement, and some of you are going to have thoughts along these lines yourself and have already experienced this, would be, first of all, um, that the sort of structure and the agenda, the structure of the meeting, the structure of the workshop, the structure of the material that you send out that you want some input from, that is like the waka that will take you where you want to go. So I think you've got to develop a good structure so you're moving toward a meaningful goal together. Uh, you just don't want a meeting that sort of 
uh, not focused and that doesn't have a clear outcome. Now, in the beginning, especially when you're taking on something like this transition to the localities, what's going to be the most effective structure for different groups is going to be something that you're going to have to discover. And it's best if that's done as a journey of discovery together. So you might try out different things and find the things that really work and the things that don't work. Um, now, along with that structure, it is really important for whoever is piloting or navigating to be really flexible. I remember when I was training initially as a facilitator, I was doing a session where I was observed by a trainer and it was a, a session where I was working on helping a, a nonprofit organization find volunteers for their organization. And um, I, I did the, the talk and the material and checked in with them and we had a certain agenda that we were following. And each time I was checking in with them, they were kind of going off topic to something else that was a real concern for them. Uh, about the prospective volunteers who might be working with them. And I sort of stuck with my talk in the face of that. And afterwards, the facilitator was training me said, what do you care more about, Sean? Do you care more about the talk or do you care more about those individuals who you were there to help? And it really hit home with me. And it really sort of uh, has been something that I've carried forward since. And as a, as a facilitator, as someone who's guiding a meeting, you know, you do have to almost imagine that tree trunk where there's different branches that people are gonna go down and that the group naturally is gonna go down. And you do have to balance that out with going down there and listening and hearing that, spending an appropriate amount of time and bringing it back to the trunk. But I do also quite commonly see, recently I was at a, a small business startup workshop um, and it was a very similar situation. And there was a, a principle about trusting your employees um, and somebody there who was a businessman he was very skeptical about that. And he said something like, well, what if your employees are idiots? Um, and the, the presenter didn't really address that because that wasn't on the screen. It was more about the, all the values and the benefits of trusting your employees. So she just stuck with the script in the face of you know, somebody who had a, a really different perspective on it. Rather than seeing that as an opportunity to be, let's throw out the script, let's throw out the slide for a moment. Let's talk about your concern let's bounce it off of other people in the group so they can share their perspective on that. So it doesn't always have to be the person who's leading the meeting who disagrees with what's happening. Um, it's more about bringing out those thoughts, giving the entire group an opportunity to share a perspective on that so people can walk away with something useful. Um, additional things that I think about when I, when I think about effective community engagement and really, um, helping a, a group participate is uh, the iceberg problem, which is, is something that you can face uh, in large groups uh, or medium groups um, or even small groups where you get the aspirations and the problems of a few people who might be confident sharing in a group um, or who might um, be the loudest voice in the room, but you can miss, and they might have a very valuable voice, so it might be really useful to hear them, but you can miss a lot of what's going on for everyone else in the room, and not only in the room, in the community. So who do you get into that sharing space in the first place, and how do you reach that wider group? So you want the top of the iceberg for sure, but you also want to find a way to uh, reach those people who are at the bottom of the iceberg. So there's some very common um, strategies that are used uh, in meetings to accomplish this. And so here we have, let's say, a traditional town hall, which we all know that um, most people are not going to feel comfortable sharing. There might be a small group who, and only a small group who will. Um, and also, uh, people don't want to appear ignorant or uninformed. So if they're lacking in confidence, they'll also hold off sharing in a, in a forum like that. So, of course, we would look to create more small group activities. Um, and, it, you know, this varies, by the way, in some countries, like so in, in Brazil, for example, comes to mind in Argentina, people are very comfortable, like lots of people in the group calling out, uh, sometimes you actually have to have them not call out, um, and sharing personal emotions, personal issues, um, very strong personal opinions about um, whatever it might be that we're focused on in the moment. And that's actually terrific as a facilitator. So if you manage and control that, it's like you can much more quickly get the entire group involved. However, of course, in, in many other countries, including here in New Zealand, I've found that it is much more useful to scaffold that sharing and have people have an opportunity to 
um, have their voice heard initially in smaller groups or even in, in partnerships um, where it's just two people who are sharing what their example for in this example with localities, what their aspirations are, what their problems with the health system are, how they would like to um, you know, see that solved or what they would like to see addressed. Um, so we do that and then scaffold that back into the, the larger group. Something else that I would say is data matters and information matters because that allows people to make more effective decisions. And so, uh, you know, resourcing experts is, is critical. However, when it comes to engaging a group and getting people's attention, it is the stories, uh, the stories of people's lives. You know, here we've got a rescue that's taking place. It's gonna grab people's attention much more quickly than it might be the data and the information. So I want to get into those people's stories of the stories of people's lives, stories that reflect the challenges that we are uh, addressing. And sometimes that can come from the group in the audience. And at other times it might be that you have stories in mind already that you wanna share that you think are really meaningful and really uh, uh, address what you're wanting to achieve with the topic that you're focused on. Um, and then you can, after you have engaged the group in this way, you can then build on with data and information so people have more knowledge for the decisions that they might be making. Um, part of the collective impact model is also is using a neutral facilitator. Uh, and I wanna talk a little bit about some of the advantages of doing that. Um, so uh, I mentioned uh, the group dynamic piece. And one of the things that you will see if the leader of an organization does take charge in running the meeting, there's advantages to it, but the disadvantages are that uh, it can really affect how people within their group participate. So people might be more differential and not share fully. Um, some people might want to please uh, whoever is the leader of that organization or that group. And so they might share in a way that sort of fits into what they think is gonna work for that leader rather than share more authentically. So if you wanna get that authentic communication, it does help to have a neutral facilitator. Uh, it also allows the leaders of the different organizations to participate in a wider variety of ways in the meeting. So for some people, it might be that they bring all of their expertise as a participant rather than having to run the meeting. Um, and in other cases, it might be that strategically a leader decides that they're going to actually sit back and they're gonna absorb what's going on in the meeting so they can use that to make decisions at a later date and then leave more space for the people within their group to share, for example. So those are some of the advantages of an independent. Oh, the other thing I would say, you know, even in, the, in your space, for example, as an independent facilitator or as a neutral facilitator, I'm not an insider. So I, I'm not familiar with all of the acronyms. I'm not familiar with all of the group speak. And those acronyms and that group speak, those things are great. They help you communicate more efficiently, but you get to what you want to achieve um, more rapidly when you can communicate using those. But for people who aren't really already an insider, they can get left feeling on the outside. And remember, one of the things people really want to avoid in a group setting is looking dumb. So if people get confused, it's the rare person who's gonna raise their hand and say, I don't know what that means. And so the nice thing about having a neutral facilitator is um, they're not an insider. And so it tends to create an atmosphere where anyone else who isn't an insider doesn't feel left out. Um, so those are some of the key things that I would consider. There's lots more. And if we had more time, I would love to hear your thoughts as well on what you all think uh, really leads to effective community engagement where you walk away from some type of workshop or get together feeling like, oh, that was really satisfying and that was really good. I'm gonna pass it back to Amarjeet and um, see if we wanted to take some space and time to uh, ask some questions or um, move on to the next space. I'm not sure how we're doing for time. Awesome. We good, Sean. And um, thank you. That was um, really insightful. The biggest take out for me there was leading from the heart, listening and hearing. And um, I really like that concept of the neutral facilitator. And we've certainly done work in this space before uh, in terms of advocating for that, in terms of a um, 
community partnership space. Um, I just want to take uh, one minute to acknowledge the, um, the collective impact framework and um, what we have done in terms of um, collaborative Aotearoa. I'm just going to share my screen one second. Um, it's tailored the approach. Um, where's my share screen? There we go. We've, we've um, tailored the approach to Aotearoa and um, really started to use language that um, we feel resonates. And this was language that really was from feedback from our lived experience and from us, from our um, network uh, across, across the moto. But give me one second. I'm just having a little technical hitch. So um, this is still considered a work in progress. And um, all the mahi that Kanita is working on with the sector and her programme director will follow Calities will take this forward. But where we got to um, was really taking a collective impact approach to localities. So you've heard Eli Happity talk about what matters to Fano. You've heard Sean talk about leading from the heart and all of that. Uh, partnership engagement with community is vital uh, and so we felt that language was more appropriate. The bit that was missing from the core conditions of collective impact whilst it's covered uh, in the literature but not a core condition is the leadership culture and AWE partnership and we really want to, wanted to encapsulate, uh, encapsulate that. My word's not coming out right this morning um, but really sort of emphasise you know in terms of our uh, titariti or Waitangi um, and that strength of iwi and, and leading, leading out the localities. And the, the other conditions um, I don't propose to go into today, but you know, Rohi activity plan was language again, instead of a, a dry, what, um, you know, locality plan or high leverage activities, we wanted to make sure it resonated. And as Sean said, data matters. Um, and with any good process, you need a backbone that brings it all together uh, with, that, and with that ongoing engagement. So we will do, um, and we have done sessions on collective impact, and we will do more. And Kenita has got some wonderful uh, resources in the wings ready to share with the network. Um, one of which I'll give you a little um, taster share, and as we wait for our, our next presenters to come on. And then um, if there are questions for Sean, let, let's jump jump into those as well. But this is an example of just one of the resources that we are starting to pull together. Bit of a work in progress, but it really um, it endorses everything that Sean has um, talked about today in terms of our engagement spectrum. Um, this was a um, model developed by the IAP2, International Association of Public Practitioners, around engagement. And I guess localities, um, we really need to be at that in that empower end of uh, the continuum. We really need to be emphasizing that whakawhanaunatanga, that trust, that connectedness, that leading from the heart, as Sean talked about. And then within that engagement and power end of the spectrum, what are the types of um, techniques we can actually use on the ground? And so we're looking to build that um, how-to guide as any good collaborative, you know, will we'll, um, work with those that are the bright lights across the motto and bring that and share that with everyone. And that data and analytical storytelling through data walks um, is really good at that sense making of what actually we need in our, um, you know, to, to fulfill what matters to Fano and their aspirations. So there's just a bit of information there and having those courageous conversations, um, you know, honest, authentic, we've heard it, it's a big common theme, but you know, the, this is just a reference point um, along with some other resources. As I say, it's a work in progress. Um, we'll test it with our network. We'll add more richness to it, um, but we're hoping to just really listen to what our network needs and put those resources out there. Now I'm just checking the chat and um, I do have a question there for you Sean. Well done Sean, as a non-medical person and coming with a consumer perspective I fully support your key messages when it comes to effectively connecting with your audience. I guess it was more of a comment that, than a question but um, good to acknowledge. Um, 
If I have time, I'm Rajita. I might just share for one moment. Is that okay? Go for it. Go for it. Um, so just kind of a, an example of, of what Amarjeet was just talking about um, would be, uh, let's say if I was talking about the community engagement continuum to a group and I was helping them to understand how valuable and useful it was, um, the power of trying to connect with people through a story um, might be that I start rather than with a deep dive into, into this different aspects of the engagement continuum, I might jump jump into a story about um, Romania, which in the 70s was starting to have a lot of urban growth. And they you know, decided to invest in a public transport system. Um, at the time, they had Nicolas Ceausescu, who was the dictator running the country. And so what happened in that case was there's engineers who came up with what they thought made the most sense for the tube map to look like. But him and his wife decided that um, they actually wanted to have the tube instead or the underground run along the river. And there was one particular uh, stop that was on the map after they created their map that was called Plata Romana, which was where the university was. And it was a very busy part of downtown. And uh, Nicholas Ceausescu's wife, uh, she said, well, no, the students are lazy. Um, they need to walk and not um, actually have a stop at the, you know, in the underground. So they built this tube line along the river in a way that was really impractical for the people of the city. And one of the busiest spots, they didn't actually have a station. Now the engineers um, secretly built a station without telling the dictators because they knew at some point they were gonna need a, need a station there. Um, and ultimately, if you, if you were to go there today, you would see that station uh, is very narrow. It's one of the, narrow stations in Europe. And people have to sort of queue up through the arches leading into the station because they had to hide that they were actually building a station there in the first place. And that's an example of, obviously an exaggerated example of how ineffective it is when you don't have input from the people who are gonna be using a system. And so if we look at all of those different aspects of community engagement continuum, considering that we can see what a difference to what we saw in Romania, where um, actually people are going to be informed of the project and what's involved in it, you know, with localities, for example. They'll be consulted, and here's the ways they'll be consulted. They'll be involved. That collaboration will continue with that continuous conversation. And so um, that hopefully gets more buy in from people when it comes to the material, which is so rich and so useful. Thanks, Emergy.